welcome to the show. I've got another great guest today. As always, Mark Kendall is on today. He's the guitarist for the band Great White, a great rock band with a lot of great songs. And for this episode, I thought I'd try something a little bit different. And since the band's story is so well documented on Wikipedia and in other interviews that I've heard, I figured I'd skip a lot of the stuff that most fans have probably already heard, like how they got the name, how they got signed, how Izzy Stradlin from Guns N' Roses suggested that they cover Once Bitten, Twice Shy, which of course went on to be their biggest hit. But all that stuff's been covered. So I'm going to try to ask him maybe some more stuff that hasn't been covered in other interviews. Uh, We're going to talk a little bit about his solo blues record, his brief time working with Janie Lane, uh, his appearance on the Joe Rogan show, his take on success and sobriety, and a few other little Easter eggs that I have uh, thrown out into this episode. And uh, I think it was a fun one for hardcore fans and uh, great white novices alike. So let me know what you think. And if you enjoyed it by uh, dropping a comment in the YouTube or social media. And uh, there we go. Thanks so much and enjoy it. Welcome, Mark Kendall, guitarist from Great White, also solo artist, I found out. Uh, so we'll have to talk yeah. about that as well. How are you doing? Yeah, pretty good, man. That's awesome. So yeah, I've, I learned a lot about you, listened to a lot of interviews. Um, I didn't, I always get fascinated when I find out that musicians are ball players. Uh, Chips Enough, I don't know if you knew Chips Enough from Enough's Enough. He almost went yeah. uh, pro with baseball, and you were also a baseball. That was kind of like one of your goals, maybe, to go pro baseball. Yeah. Um, actually, I do know Chip, and we're Twitter friends. Um, he he kind of chimes in on my Twitter now and then, and I uh, didn't know about his baseball. But yeah, I played until I was 18. And um, loved it. Um, just wasn't quite, you know, uh, on the level of uh, pro caliber. I was a little under on the pro caliber level, you know. That and that's what really held me back and frustrated me. My arm was hurting when I was eighteen. That wasn't a good sign. Hey, it was it. Now, did I hear this right though? That you're so because you, your dad was a semi pro player, but also a musician. Um, but he pushed you more into the baseball than the yeah. music. And you were saying, well, I think it's more realistic for me to be, to make it in music than baseball. Yeah. What happened was my, my dad was kind of, he was a great player. He was a trumpet player in, in a lot of jazz groups played with a lot of great people, but he kind of didn't make it. So he did kind of uh, put the baseball in front of me and I loved it, but he kind of figured, you know, like father, like son, like, if, if I go to the music, maybe I'll follow in his footsteps and not quite get there. But the thing was when I was 18 and I, and I realized no scouts were going to be hunting for me when I'm like third best on my own team, <laughs> I, I felt like and I already loved guitar. I mean, I literally walked around with a guitar when I'd go to the store because I didn't want to leave it for 15 minutes. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So, so I had that love at 15 for my guitar and music and was actually playing in little bands without a singer, playing I'm going home in an apartment building and all that. But uh, so I was divided, you know, with the two things, with the baseball and, and music. And when it started to get disheartening, my arm hurt and, you know, I'd have my dad take me out after the third inning you know, I used to motion my dad to come take me out because my arm was killing me. And uh, it was actually from throwing fastballs. Uh, it wasn't from curves because oh. I was throwing curves when I was 11, 12 years old that broke like four feet. And everybody goes, oh, he's going to hurt his elbow. And, you know, that's not good. He's throwing all those curves. But the curves never hurt me. It was the fastballs that hurt me. And when I look back, I think, had I worked out with light weights, maybe, you know, gained some strength in my arm or something, I wouldn't have thrown it out. Because today, even if I throw a football one time, the pain immediately in the same spot. Interesting. So, so yeah, I kind of threw my arm out. So that's when I, I decided 18 to go full-time music. And, you know, my dad's telling me, you know, well, only one in a million make it in music. And he was a little disheartened. But he also supported it. He was totally um, into me being, he just didn't, he just thought the chances of me taking that, you know, really far weren't that good. 
But he, but he believed you. He thought baseball was a better shot because that's unusual. Usually parents say, no way yeah. you're going to make it as a baseball player. That's. Yeah. I think he was thinking with his heart more than his brain. Mm. You know, he wanted that for me, even though he probably thought it was impossible. So that's the only thing I can think. Yeah, because you had, I a, had two guys. Yeah, go ahead. I was just going to say, you, you had an interesting take on your success. Like you said that you're friends with a lot of guitar players that didn't make it. And uh, you think yeah. you made it because you put in the time. And you tried to play as much as possible. Like you guys did a bunch of shows for free. And I don't know if you yeah. um, if you're familiar with drummer Rich Redman, but he's uh, Jason Aldean's drummer, and he had kind of a similar story. Like playing in Nashville, yeah. he said he played with so many different bands, and not just country music. He said he was in reggae and metal and all sorts of different bands, and he just kept going. And he saw the same yeah. thing. Like friends of his would kind of disappear, and they get married, and and yeah. he just and finally he found Jason Aldean, and, and the rest is history. It's like some of it's just like perseverance. It seems like that's yeah, a big piece absolutely. of it. Absolutely. Yeah, well stated. Um, I really do think it's pure perseverance because the the guitar players that were around when Van Halen was kind of in their early years local, what the guitar players were insane. I mean, they were so good that I had a lot of competition and I figured, you know, that the good road was to play as often as possible and give, give ourselves a chance for somebody to be able to help us. Yeah, you know, it's like not bit, only the practice. Yeah, it's not only the practice of playing, but the exposure is what you're saying. Like the more yeah. chances somebody will see you and take an interest, and that's eventually, obviously, what happened. And and besides that, you get better because we're playing more than everyone, mm -hmm. one. so we're getting tighter. So when eventually maybe there is, you know, if somebody is in the crowd that can help us, may A and R guy or whoever, maybe some guy that knows somebody or whatever that we're playing well, you know? Mm -hmm. So uh, th there's that too. But that was part of what Van Halen did for me was the work ethic. They played every night. I'm mm -hmm. not kidding you. These guys played every night. They really were workhorses. And and that that's what I kind of took from them because as far as Eddie Van Halen, yeah, he's the best guitar player around, but I didn't really... Uh, my style was so much different and I learned from s such a different style of guitar player that, you know, the Carlos Santana's and, you know, Johnny winter and stuff that I was so into that. But at the same time, I love Van Halen. I love their work ethic. And I go, if we're going to have any chance at all, man, with all these bands and all these great bands around with great guitar players, we got to play more than all of them. You know what I mean? Yeah. And that and that's what we did. That's really smart. And then also, this is another thing that I found that was really interesting that you guys did is that you would pretend that you're playing in these big venues and you'd pretend that you're doing interviews for magazine and radio or like you'd practice yeah. that. I'm like, that's actually yeah. really smart, though, because I think there's like books on this, like vis visualization kind of exercises. And th this is like an advanced yeah. psychological technique that I don't know if you guys probably didn't know you were doing that, but no. I think that a lot of motivational people would tell you to do this kind of stuff. Like Tony Robbins is really into that kind of thing. Yeah. It's like you, um, you put your dreams into action and actually pretend like it happened. Um, I don't know. You, you know, I know what, like sometimes if you buy a red truck, you see like 300 of them, <laughs> you know, maybe didn't see them before. Right. Uh, you know, good the stuff that we dreamed about started to happen, but we, at the same time, we were fighting for it. So, yeah, we pretended like we were playing the forum in a living room and, you know, did all that stuff and interviewed each other and asked each other questions that we thought a journalist, a rock journalist would ask. That's so cool. So, yeah. So we'd have little cassette players. And then, so how long has the band been together? but we're we're two band members and we know all these answers so, so it was kind of it's kind of goofy but um but all, all the things that we dreamed about and wanted and pretended like were going to happen all happened that's what that's what's so amazing about it is we dreamed about playing the forum because when we were 15 16 years old we were seeing led zeppelin and you know Ted Nugent flying through the building in loincloth, you know, and, and it was a dream to play there and, and it happened, but we'd been pretending to play there for 
<laughs> you know, we're, we're, you know, in the early years. So, um, yeah, it, it, it's, uh, you know, I forget what they call that. Um, what is that? Um, where like you put like maybe a bulletin board on your wall. Oh, a vision board. Yeah. Like a vision board of all these, you want this house, you want yeah. this car, you want all this. It, it's called the uh, law of attraction. Yes, I believe. that's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we were kind of doing the law of attraction thing way back then, not knowing we're doing the law of attraction. Right. You know? Yeah. And, and, uh, but we worked hard at the same time. So, you know, I don't know. It, it's a, it, it really does seem surreal when things start going your way, but um, then you kind of feel like, you know, we're not like an overnight success or, you know, like we were lazy and just got lucky. Uh, we, we got lucky. We totally understand that. We're grateful for that. But we, we, from all the stuff that we did playing more than everybody and all that, we put ourselves in a pretty good position you know, to get lucky. Right. You're in the, because, the right city. Yeah. You're playing as much as you can. Are you working a day yeah. job at this time too? Or are you able to oh, just. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. Geez. I worked at a potato chip factory. I paid in the back of AM PM signs. I, uh, you know, oh, I, wow. I had every kind of little job you can imagine. I, when I was working at the potato chip factory, it was Lay's potato chips. Uh, we just put boxes on these, on these uh, pallets and all we would talk about is the set list we're going to play, you know, because we were playing five sets a night. So, so we go straight from work to Walter Mitty's and play five hours and then get up and go do the stay gig again. So wow. it was pretty amazing. But, uh, you know, back then uh, we played cover songs, you know, and, and we played, we wrote songs while we were doing the covers. So we kind of hmm. every once in a while would play an original song you know just kind of throw it in like it's some obscure song that you don't know about type mm. deal but um at the same time you know we're playing petty and you know uh, god um just all, er, every cover under the sun yeah so. i heard you guys do a cover of i didn't know that anyone had done this i've been saying this for years somebody should cover the who's substitute and you guys did it and there's a music video of it and it's good and it it's interesting because it's yeah. like a different almost a different version of the band. Like you guys sound a lot heavier back in those early days. Uh, yeah, we did. We were heavier back then because for one thing, we didn't have keyboards. So it was just a trio with the lead singer, bass, guitar, drums, and, you know, kind of limits you. And at the same time, we, on the way to work at this one point, we were working at a factory where they actually blew dynamite up and it was underwater power it was real hardcore, actually kind of a dangerous job. Hmm. And, uh, you know, where you got to wear a helmet, safety goggles and all this stuff. So on the way to work in the morning, we'd always blast like uh, old Scorpions and Judas Priest. Yeah. And, and we love that, you know. But my influences are all blues type people. That's what's so funny. But I, there was something about accept and and all this stuff it was kind of rebellious in a way and it, you know we were real young and, and uh, there was just something about it it kind of wakes you up it's almost like having coffee or something totally so so in our early early years we were trying to be like that because these bands were flying under the radar they weren't mm -hmm. big commercial bands judas priest was barely known you know scorpions were they didn't have like hits on the radio or anything so we thought we could get away with trying to be like them. So, you know, we weren't being true to ourselves, but we were, it was an early part of our writing. And so, um, you know, it didn't come until later where I started playing from, you know, the people that influenced me. I was free to do whatever I wanted. And that's when the bluesier side of things started to happen. Yeah. In the original first album, it wasn't like that. We were just trying to be, we didn't sound anything like Judas Priest or Scorpion, but we were trying to be that. Right. You know? Didn't you, is it true you had uh, John Bush from Armored Saint and Anthrax had auditioned for the band at one point? Uh, Do you have any memories of that? Yeah. Yeah. Well, what happened was um, George Lynch had uh, taken our girl singer that we had. Yeah. Did that make and, you mad, by the she, way? <laughs> yeah, but here's here's the funny thing. We did a private party with Lynch Mob and 
Night Ranger for this Microsoft dude in Texas. And mm -hmm. I mean, full production, we set up on this tennis court, played for a hundred employees. It, it, it was pretty amazing. And he got kind of drunk one night and he's going, hey man, sorry I took that singer years ago. 35 years later, he's apologizing. <laughs> it was hysterical. <laughs> but uh, he goes, hey, hey, it, it, it didn't work out. She was a nightmare. So, you know, you got the best end of that. And anyway, so we ended up getting this other singer called Butch, but we auditioned John Bush and I love John Bush. Yeah. He's got a great voice. And, um, but the way I was writing songs, it was kind of geared for somebody with a little higher range. Mm. You know, this was just my thinking. Back okay. Then. So as great as he was, I wanted the guy that could sing like Halford at the time. Yeah. So I, that's what I, I went with that. Okay. Know? Yeah. And then obviously you get Jack Russell, the rest is history. You know, I think yeah. originally named Dante Fox, he changed it to great white. You have tons of hits, tons of success. I always thought this was um, interesting though, because obviously the scene, the music scene changes and then you guys have this awesome comeback. Uh, Can't get there from here album that uh, I remember living in Seattle in the nineties at the time. And I'm thinking, I'm never going to hear the bands I love on the radio. And they played Rolling Stone on the rock radio. What a great song. That's right. Co-written by uh, Jack Blades. Were you surprised yeah. to be able to have a comeback at that point, or was that what you were expecting all along? No. Well, it, it was just an unfortunate time. That record, if you listen to it from start to finish, it's a very strong record. Yeah, had I agree. Out, had that come out in, in our heyday, I really believe it would have done very well. Um, it was just a bad time. Like We had a number one song that Rolling Stone was number one in Detroit. And we sold 75 records, you know, so there oh. wasn't a big push uh, yeah. um, from w as far as the uh, marketing dollars were concerned. Sure. Um, Kologner really didn't get that much support um, for, for, you know, signing White Snake, Rat and us, you know, trying what what happened was he felt like the 80s ended too soon. You know, he, he felt like we had more to say mm -hmm. and we could make good records. So, but he didn't get the support from the label with the marketing dollars. So, yeah. he, you know, we were doing like meet and greets with rap, you know, could save whatever. I don't know, but it was funny. I remember Piercy going, let's write each other's names down <laughs> just for a joke. <laughs> you know? So uh, it, it was, uh, it was a very, very good record, but unfortunately, because of the time, the timing of it, it, it just got overlooked. But hmm. I, I can listen to that today. There, there's some good things on that record. Absolutely. Was there any bands, like you say the Indies, 80s ended too early, was there any bands that maybe uh, that you thought were going to be huge but didn't make it either because maybe of that timing or because internal problems or marketing or some other thing like what was there any band that you saw and you're like oh these guys are going to be huge and then for whatever reason they didn't um you know it, it, it was hard to keep up with all that i know it got a little bit watered down toward the end of the 80s mm. and everybody sounded like docking you know everybody it was very predictable the music the lyrics and everything you you could you know, before the course even came, you knew what was going to happen. You know what I mean? There yeah. was no surprises. So I think that might have hurt it a little bit. Plus, the fashion was so similar, you know. Um, so er every label was signing everybody. Uh, I'm, You know, we've actually played with a few bands that I never even heard of that were supposedly a, a kind of a big deal in a way, had hmm. a lot of fans. Um, on a couple of these cruises, I'm going, wow, you know, and uh, so I don't know. Um, it was kind of hard to keep up with it. I only knew the the circle of bands that we either played with or were on the radio. I, I was it. It was hard to follow because you got to realize we were on a freight train, man. We were just like or bullet train, if you will on tour nonstop. I mean, one time for two years, it was like, I turned two ages when, on one tour. I left my house, I was 31, came home 33. You know what I mean? <laughs> oh my gosh. And, I mean, literally, our break was going to the Bahamas for five days and then going right back to New York. And 
you know, all this stuff going on. So it was, it was just nonstop touring, you know? So does traveling stress you out or not necessarily stress you out, but is that not really like a vacation because you do so much touring and traveling anyways? Do you want to just stay at home when you're, when you have time off? Um, you know, I, I really enjoyed it. Uh, you know, being out there, um, ha having our, you know, getting our music to the people and everything that was happening with radio and MTV and all that. It was a lot of fun. Um, so yeah, it, it's, it's a big sacrifice to watch your children grow up on a videotape. I mean, it, it's brutal, but, uh, yeah, I, I enjoyed it when, when we got home and stuff and, you know, see my friends and family and hang out and, kind of you know be normal yeah my my friends weren't really you know they didn't bow to me or you know you know tell me how great i am or anything you know they're just like dude you know what's up <laughs> it, it wasn't you know it was it wasn't any big deal that i was in a band or anything i, I had some i still do have really good friends that's good i think having those same friends keeps you grounded probably Totally. Yeah. Totally. yeah. So in, in 2005, we got to talk about this solo record that I, I just discovered. I mean, this is a full on blues record, not bluesy rock. This is the blues. I mean, this is old school blues. I loved it. It must be really refreshing and kind of re-energizing to go ahead and make that and play a different style of music. Not that you obviously didn't like Great White, but sometimes it's nice to just try something else. And then and then also when you go back to Great White, you feel more energized because you're able to do yeah. something different. Right. Yeah. Well, what it does is, is you see, when you listen to that record, you can see what I, what I bring to Great White, my, my end of, mm -hmm. it, you know, musically, what, you know, if, if you can compartmentalize that, that um, you know, to see my part and then see what they do. It, it, it's kind of neat for me. The most challenging thing was singing because I don't really consider myself a lead singer. I'm kind of in the Hendrix, T. Ray Vaughn range, you know? I, yeah. I'm, I'm not going to put like a Zeppelin song on my solo album. No, 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 that'd <laughs> be scary. That, yeah. You know? So I had this certain range, but it, it was still tough. It, it was very tough. But what happened was I met, I was at some award show in LA, kind of a local award show. And I wasn't nominated for anything. I was just there because a friend of mine was in a local band. So I went down there, ended up speaking with this, this lady, this girl um, who was a piano player and her husband can't remember his last name. His name is Bob had um, Grammys from his work with the temptations. And I, and she's like, we should get together and write something and maybe record something. And, they had a studio in North Hollywood at their house, a really full blown studio. So I went there and then I, I go, man, I could do a full solo album here. So I located some musicians and she actually played a little bit of piano and a couple string things on the record. Um, she was totally gifted. I mean, we're talking like jazz and you know, just monster musician. But I ended up getting uh, this bass player and he would actually play drums for Tower of Power for five years. His name's Steve Monreal. And he, he goes, I got the perfect drummer. He won the Buddy Rich contest two years in a row because he has all these skills, but he, he'll lay down that blue stuff like nobody's business. And I go, I totally trust you. You've been in Tower of Power. I need, mean, you know, like, you know what groove is, you know? So we only rehearsed two days before making that record. I, I wow. really had a lot of riffs laying around and, and I just really put the pedal to the metal on the writing. You know, the lyrics came pretty quickly. And we went and recorded this thing in just like three weeks or so. And Bob knew all these people from his years with the R&B and Temptations. So I needed some background support. So I knew this lead singer that was in a local band called Yankee Rose years ago. Real good friend of mine, Michael Adams. And he came down and kind of helped with the harmonies. And then we got this girl that was in like a Supremes kind of band named Patty Brooks. 
and she did backgrounds with my Michael. So that really oh. kind of supported my my lead vocal a little bit, you know, little one liners on on some, you know, lead vocal lines. And didn't you have a, a Eric Clapton's keyboard player, Dickie Sims, who played on some big songs for Mar Eric yeah. Clapton? That's because when I first wanted to do the solo album, um, <laughs> had the idea about it. I went and worked with a friend of mine named Todd Griffin, who was on Geffen for just one record that uh, they were called Graveyard Train. Um, he had, they actually opened for us on this little tour in the 90s. But anyways, I went to write with him just, you know, a couple songs. And he's like singing while we're doing this. And I'm going, God, man, your voice is so awesome. I'd rather just have you sing and let's just make this like a project. So we made a demo and um, got this bass player and, and this drummer and met Dickie Sims while we were doing the demo. He was doing a demo from some new age band that was current. Hmm. And I go, hey man, could you play some keyboards? I'll, I'll throw you a couple hundred and, you know, just cause this one song, I really wanted that B3 kind of sound. And I, I knew he played on Shot the Sheriff and, and uh, Cocaine and had that, you know, that Leslie kind of vibe. And I go, that'd be so perfect. And I go to show him the song and his friends with him. And he goes, uh, uh, you don't need to do that. He knows it. I go, what? He knows it. He's like, just play. He'll come in. <laughs> sure wow. enough, man, we roll tape one, two, three, four. And he, he just nailed it. I'm going, this guy, who is this guy? Wow. Man? And, and uh, so I told him, you know, I'm kind of making this band. Are you interested in maybe doing the record? And he's like, yeah, for sure, man. So we made a record and we ended up calling it. We came up with the band name instead because I couldn't make it a solo project because I had a lead singer. I figured I got to sing if it's going to be a solo. Album. So we just called it Train Station. We made this killer record. It's awesome. And, uh, you know, of course, it got no attention whatsoever, but I, I still can listen to it and it holds up pretty good yeah did you ever do any live shows with that kind of stuff or would you yeah oh did yeah, okay i did we we played uh, about 12 to 15 shows up north opening for a guy called johnny highland hmm. who was out with a trio he's like the best guitar player in nashville this guy's like totally insane wow. just look him up on youtube okay dude. i will it'll blow your mind he's played he played with toby keith all, all the like all, all the Nashville records. He's, he's like a session guy. Yeah. But like Sammy Hagar kidnapped him and he played with Sammy Hagar for five shows and just dwarfed his guitar player. <laughs> but the guy weighs like 300. He's legally blind and all this stuff, but they're playing going wow. down by Jeff Beck and just tearing it up. I mean, mind blowing skills. Oh, I'll have to but check anyways, that out. So we opened for him. We played some festivals up North and stuff. And, um, you know, a few uh, kind of theater type shows. Mm -hmm. And that was it. It was kind of short lived, you know. And to tell you the truth, the band, I couldn't believe how green they were. I, I mean, they hmm. were so like unprofessional and I, I'm not like used to that. They would do things like five minutes before we're, we go on stage, they'd be like in the crowd somewhere. <laughs> I can't believe it because the keyboard player has been with Eric Clapton. You know, this other guy has toured. Um, you know, they opened for Ted Nugent at one point. So he knows like the backstage thing and, sure. you know, like, everything you're supposed to do. So because I was willing to even go to the, the starting over mode, if you will, of, you know, loading pickup trucks and, you know, all that stuff. I didn't care. We're going to play the whiskey and we get a couple of trucks, you know, because this guy had a huge, the huge Leslie cabinet that weighed like 300 pounds. And uh, so I was willing to do that, all that, but I, I wasn't willing to deal with the unprofessional side of it. it yeah. Was so, it was so non pro. And here I am, I've been in a band for a long time. I know how to act and how to deal with, uh, you know, being a, being professional and and these guys were like 
they were treating it like we were just some lame ass club band didn't know what we were doing interesting <laughs> so, okay. yeah so that that was disheartening so i i kind of got away from from that but gotcha. it was good though that's one thing it really was good yeah i like what i heard um, and in 2010, you guys uh, did a few shows with Janie Lane. I didn't really know a lot about this because um, I thought he was struggling at that point. But then I heard you talking about when he worked with you for those 10 shows, he was stone cold sober. He was overly prepared, total pro. And it was an interesting take you had on it that uh, he said that he struggled when he had downtime. Is that pretty common for a lot of people with that with addiction that they they need to be busy and, and having something to do? Yeah. I think that I think that's common, um, you know, because when you have downtime, you know, you might get a bad thought and, and you know, maybe relapse or do the wrong thing. But that's why they have sponsors um, when you're in uh, programs and stuff. Someone you can call if you get that negative thought or, you know, one thing I tell the guys I work with is the actual urge to drink or do your drug only lasts two minutes. That's it. Really? The actual, the actual physical urge to drink only lasts two minutes. It's the planning and the thinking about it that goes on and on and on. Huh. So if you can get through that urge and, you know, call phone a friend, if you will, and, and maybe tell them what you're thinking. And, you know, after a conversation, sometimes you can get through those times. And, yeah, you know, so Janie, like you, you just said every everything uh, about him being professional and prepared and being on time and sober, singing really well. Um, he got a bunch of downtime and just got a bad thought and didn't call no one. Because huh. I used to send him meditation and prayer every day, and we talked on the phone. He would say, "God, that hit home," and you know, he was really into it and, and really did want to be a sober man. Yeah, you had an interesting take on that, too, that you you've learned not to take anyone's addiction personal. Even if you've tried to help them, you can't blame yourself because ultimately these are these are adults that we're, we're dealing with. And you can't it's really hard to you can't make up someone else's mind, basically, if they wanted. I mean, if he would have called you, I'm sure you would have helped him. Oh, yeah. Yeah. In the early going, when I first started working with people 10 years ago, I uh, it, I would really be hurt when when they didn't make it and but then i learned over time after speaking with a few people that just don't take their addiction personal you know and once i started doing that even though i really wanted them to do well if they kind of fell off i would encourage them to start over and you know that type of deal but it, it, i still feel it but you know when somebody doesn't make it make it and you know remain sick, if you will, that that's, you know, it's frustrating. But then again, I've seen so much success, like beyond the numbers that I'm supposed to see. So that that's encouraging. Yeah. You said that's like a huge high when you can help somebody like a rush, if you will, that when you yeah. see somebody get better and you're a part of that, I mean, that's just like yeah. a, a natural high, a huge rush. And I never knew that I've heard this. My mom was very giving. And she, she was always helping people all the time. And I'm just like, God, when are you going to do something for yourself? You know? And, but now I realize what, kind of why she did it. You get so much back, just the way you feel. It, it energizes you and the positivity is all around you when you, when you do that, when you help a person in need. And I didn't really realize um, you know, the level uh, of it that I would feel. And man, when I started to see these people were just had no chance and all of a sudden they're just doing like amazing. It, man, I wanted more of that because of the way I, what I was getting from it to, to look at that and, and see somebody that was dying, get well, it was, it, it, it charges you. You know, um, but I didn't realize the level it charges you. It, it, it's so it's so much positive energy that I, I just can't stop. I, I just want to, you know, I want to pick people up and let them know that there's another life available out there. 
And, you know, especially since I was able to change my life and, and um, not just remove alcohol, but make a lot of changes with the way I lived and, and uh, be more honest with myself and stuff like that. Yeah. Can we um, talk about that for a second? Cause yeah. I thought this was really fascinating. Um, you talked about, you know, with the beer, you just drank beer. You're never really a big heart. I mean, right. that was kind of your crutch was to have a couple beers and that kind of helped you deal with people. Like you, you said that you maybe had this fear of people and I thought this was interesting. So as you're getting sober, uh, you know, you're transitioning and things are getting better. Uh, you kind of did this thing. Uh, you didn't like confrontation. And so uh, you tried to practice confronting people who upset you and you start, you, right. it was like practicing, right? Like you're doing it every right. day. And instead yeah. of that fear of people, the fear started to go away and the confidence went up. I thought this is really interesting. Yeah. Uh, can you give me some examples of that? Like, what would you do? Like just little things, like if somebody got your order wrong at a restaurant or. Yeah. Um, it, it, I would just at least do two a day. And I was always in situations, you know, if you hear somebody in a conversation that's not even about you, but they're talking shit about somebody, I would literally get involved with that. Hmm. And I would never do that. And it's really none of my business, but I'm practicing. Yeah. I'm practicing confrontation. You know, what does that do for you? You know, when you, when you're talking bad about people, I mean, you know, everybody has shortcomings and, you know, you know, when you do that, it, it kind of makes me feel a certain way. Okay. So that's the way I would do it. And after a while, all this, everything that I was kind of afraid of, was nonsense, you know? So mm. like you said, yeah, it gave me confidence. And where I really struggled um, was small groups of people. Like I'm talking like 15 people at, at like a party, a little gathering. And, you know, maybe they want me to play my acoustic guitar. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that, that was frightening me, you know, for some reason. And, and just, uh, being conversational with, with someone, you know, with just a small group, I, I was really shy and, and it made me nervous. And, um, you know, so I needed to fix that. And that's the way I did it by confronting people. And all of a sudden I, now what it does when you do this for a long period of time, you start to feel more comfortable in your own skin, you know? And, you know, this embedded fear that I've lived with forever is, is part of the reason that I use beer for a vehicle for almost like confidence, kind of numb all that fear. And you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But But then what happens is it becomes a rut. And now I begin, I'm just chasing normal. It's like, Instead of getting super drunk, that's not what I'm really trying to do. I'm just trying to not feel pain and make all the fear and shame and guilt go away. But then I would keep going and end up drunk. But, you know, it just it became such a rut that that life of kind of really just being sick all the time, you know, feeling sick when you wake up and you have you have to use this beer or alcohol to make yourself well and it, it runs your body down you know you can't do anything 100 percent. it's a lot harder too the older you get i've noticed that like sure. you know i could drink in my 20s and then uh you know not it wouldn't bother you know after another day i'd be fine but now as i get older i'm like if i have a couple of drinks it's like i feel it for a few days yeah it's a, you, you need to replenish the body and and um get back to normal it takes a lot longer when you're like you said when you're young you know, you can party down, drink, you know, a case of beer and you're out playing basketball the next morning. Yeah, <laughs> no know? big deal. <laughs> and and it's a hangover. See, what happened with me is that like beyond the hangover, I had shaky hands. I didn't feel well. The pain went all the way down to my feet. I mean, it was just like. So I really got kind of sick of that. And plus the lying I was such a, you know, just a bona fide, I, everything I told my wife, even if I didn't have to lie, I would come up with a lie, even when it wasn't, really? it wasn't necessary. Huh. Yeah, because I was so used to lying and, and sneaking with my alcohol. Um, 
you know, especially on the road. Oh, no, I'm not drunk. I, your voice sounds funny. You know, <laughs> Hon, I'm not drinking. Huh. I'm not drinking. And, I, you know, I got like a beer right next to me. You know, so that's what I mean. It's just they kind of go together, you know, when you're uh, abusing alcohol and you got a family, that, you know, you need to, to fib. But uh, so I don't have to do that anymore. It, it's just an easier life today. And I play better. I do everything better. That's the good thing. Yeah. That's and the good news. You're taking care of yourself. Um, you, I, I think you lost some weight because I saw a video. I watched uh, your uh, Joe Rogan interview and I'm like, dude, you look a lot skinnier. Was that the point where you said, because you guys were talking about, oh, yeah, I should try to start eating healthier and stuff. Now you're doing Pilates, yeah. I think. is That that must be helping yeah. a lot. Yeah. Um, actually, I was a little overweight in that video and uh, on Joe Rogan. And I did get it. You know, we talked a lot about healthy eating. Yeah. He gave me a lot of roads to go. And I went on this like 30 days of uh, shakes and then this, you know, healthy meal. Um, and I lost like 20 pounds in a month. Dang. Just just weight that's not supposed to be on me. It's abnormal. It just kind of went away you know, okay. pretty quickly. Then it Then it's a little slower after that. But. I had 20 pounds. It just wasn't supposed to be there. But today, yeah, I actually got a Pilates machine at my house now that I do every morning. Uh, I was going to, you know, I learned so much from the trainer that I know how to do it myself. So I know all the whole routine. So I just bought a Pilates machine for my house. And, and that way I don't have to drive and good go through all that no that's you know, i could just do it here that's smart you look great but yeah i was back to joe rogan i had a question about that like what is it like being a guest on that show because that's got to be the biggest podcast in the world right now right like what yeah. what sets him apart from other shows that you've done well you know one well i could just say what i like about it is i actually learned some things from him he's really well versed on so many subjects and we also had um, pool. He's uh, yeah. an avid. He loves pool, and he's a big fan. And I'm kind of like known as. And I'm not bragging. This is just coming from people that are pro pool players. That I'm probably the best celebrity player like in the country, because and that's only because I played pool since I was a kid. Like mm -hmm. so, I I'm pretty decent at pool. I played in the World Championships in New York. Uh, a couple years ago and did you, you know, play when, rogan yeah i played him right there did you and, beat him yeah oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh yeah he, he's not he's a good player though yeah I oh, mean, sure. he can run out like a, a rack and he can break and run out of a rack and nine ball i'm just like on a little higher higher level and he knew that but yeah he had a, i couldn't believe it. he had a diamond table right there in his office you know right next to where he does the podcast oh. So he, I mean, this guy loves pool, um, you know, so we had that in common and yeah, um, I really just enjoyed hanging out with him because he, he's really a super guy. Um, he's done quite a bit and, and uh, he's really into health and, and that I really gravitated toward that, uh, getting information from him and stuff on, on health. And back then I was pounding Diet Cokes. That wasn't helping me. Mm. And, you know, just drinking too much Diet Coke and all that soda. You know. Is that something that when you transition, because I noticed it's always interesting yeah. with AA meetings, you always see yeah. a giant pot of coffee and then everyone's yeah. smoking cigarettes. And yeah. is that something that they, they want to try to replace that? Like, what about with like non-alcoholic beer? Is that something that a lot of uh, people that go through the program gravitate towards or is that frowned upon? I think... Some do that, you know, I don't think it's a huge percentage, um, but the cigarettes, yeah, I had to quit cigarettes. Um, I, especially, I kind of transitioned into this Diet Coke kind of habit. So hmm. I really had to start watching, you know, I'm so compulsive. That's part of my problem. I'm hmm. really, so I need to get into things that are good for me, like eating healthy, you know, not smoking and, and not drinking and getting exercise and you know um so i don't know man 
Yeah. Well, it sounds like you're you're doing that, and it, it also sounds. Do you do you like to read a lot, or is it? Um, I think I heard you say you're really into documentaries because, like, yeah. even just listening to you and Rogan go back and forth, you knew a lot of stuff about some of these comedians than Rogan knew, and I thought that was really interesting. Yeah. Like you you you're really knowledgeable on a lot of that stuff. Yeah, yeah. I've I've learned a lot of things. Uh, you know, now that we have all this modern technology with the you know YouTube and all this stuff, you can you know, pull up a documentary of your heroes and really listen to their story. And it's usually a really interesting one. And, um, you know, I have a story of my own from being a young child up till now. So I'm really fascinated how similar some of these guys' stories are to mine, you know, but I'm sure we can all relate uh, different points of your life that you can relate to another person. But um, yeah. So I, I'm just interested. I've met so many people in my life. Um, all, all my heroes, as far as guitar players go, you know, the Blackmores, the Billy Gibbons, and, and all these guys that Johnny Winter, I mean, I've hung with, I, you know, rest in peace, uh, but I've hung with him several times, long conversation. And it, it's just, that's kind of a dream of mine too, because all these people I, I worship being an up and comer and, ain't never been, hopefully it happens, guy, you know, to meet all these guys as peers, you know, even though I still am like, I'm not worthy, you know, but, um, and have them be just down to earth and so cool. It, it, it's really neat. Yeah, that's what I've noticed. I, I I think I'm at 143 episodes or 44, something like that. And the first 130, I felt like everybody was over the top nice. But then as my show grows and I start to get some bigger names, some of the, the bigger names are you're not over the top nice. Have you run yeah. into that a little bit too with some of the some people that maybe were a little disappointing when you met them or um actually the ones that aren't nice are usually the non-legend ones. You know, the ones that are bitter? Yeah, yeah, the ones that think they're supposed to be legends ah. but they're not actually quite there yet they're they usually might have an attitude or you know there's a lot of these guys that are great guitar players i i just don't want to mention names but sure they're really good guitar players and you know they got a hardcore bid for recognition out there and they're really forcing it, man. They want accolades so bad. And those guys might be a little short with you when you run into them. But people like the Johnny Winner and, you know, um, you know, I met uh, Mick Box, you know, uh, every, everybody that, that were legends to me, Rick Derringer and, you know, people that I run to that are like that are down to earth, really cool dudes, you know, not like this dig me ambition kind of attitude. Hmm. They're more like they don't even talk about music and, you know, how how are you doing? Even believe it or not, and I knew this guy's got a bad rap over the years, but every time I've hung with David Lee Roth, you know, just in a conversation, you know, everybody talks about his big ego and all this. All he wanted to know is what I was up to. What are you huh. doing? How's the band? You know, are you guys still playing around? You, you know, what's happening? It, it was like he didn't talk about himself once. I had to like coax it out of him. Interesting. Know? That's but, yeah, yeah, that's really interesting. He was such a, he really knows how to be, um, you know, personable. Um, ask about you. You know, how, how's the family? How's your wife? How's your kids? You know. He's more of that type of person. His persona in the press is different. You know, it's like a different guy. But it's like anybody. If you meet a comedian, I, I've met Don Rickles a couple of times, actually been to his shows. But when you hang out with him, he's a completely different person, obviously, than he is on stage. I mean, that's naturally because that's a show he's putting on. But I so he doesn't like that. rip on people and then try to oh, like, no. okay. I, I thought he was going to rip on me because I... When yeah, I'd be first, scared. We were first invited to a show. It was in the 80, 88 or so, right? So it was a, kind of our heyday era. 
and we went there. I had my bolero on, and I thought he was gonna like, you know, whistle the the Clint Eastwood theme or something, you know. <laughs> and, uh, so we walked back, and he's like, "Hey, you guys, congratulations! Like, you know, you, I know you're doing real good right now." He goes, "I had you two down here a couple weeks ago, and they were sweet too. My kid loves them." And, and all this stuff, like he was just this normal Joe. And I was like, huh. whoa, <laughs> you know, this is, and then I saw him again in 2008, went to a show and backstage and stuff. And he was all sweet then, you know, he, he can turn it off and on, but ah. that's the same way with the musicians I met. They're, they're just, you know, like when you're a teenager, you probably can relate. It's like Zepp, Led Zeppelin are like aliens. Like they don't drive through McDonald's. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Like these guys are are larger than life in your mind. Right. You know what I mean? When you grow older and you're in a band for a long time, you realize they're they're just human beings that wrote really great songs. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. So when you meet them, you know, I'm a little starstruck, but at the same time, I can have a conversation and they're so down to earth. It, it's such a relief to me because my worst fear was meeting like one of my guitar heroes, like a Blackmore or, or whoever, and have them be total jerks and just, you know, just be total idiots. So then I would have that, you know, picture in my right. mind. Right. It would ruin instead it. Of, instead of the, you know, that guy is a guitar god. I can't believe how great he is. Yeah. I try to separate it sometimes because I go, well, I like this music or I like this movie. I don't necessarily have to agree with this person's political beliefs or their right, personality, right. the way they treat people. Sure. But uh, yeah, sometimes it's hard to separate those two things depending on, you know, what kind of things they've done in their personal very life. So. Very difficult. Yeah. Um, you know, I've, I've had like actors that I really liked and then they get in the political world and they, I won't mention this guy's name, but he almost acted ignorant. Like I couldn't believe it because he's so huge uh, um, I've always respected the way he was in movies. And then he goes out there and he's like, you know, uh, ignorant. That's the only thing I, I like unaged, uneducated type of ignorance, like just like a dumbass. <laughs> you know? and, like I can't yeah. even watch a movie the guy's in anymore because I, all, I just got that picture in my mind. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's hard to separate that sometimes. Like now you've got this connection. Like when I had a bad interview, now it's like, whenever I hear that person's song, I'm like, mm, just tell I turn this off. Like, it just reminds me of how they were a jerk to me. Like, I don't really want to listen. I don't know. It's hard. But thankfully most of the people I've met have been like you said, down to earth. And because I yeah. think they're happy. I think they're doing what they yeah. love. They get to play music or I've had comedians on. So whether it's do stand up or whatever, they're usually yeah. doing something they love that's creative. And so they're uh, grateful. Yes. They're grateful. That, yeah, that's, that's the huge. Whole thing. They feel blessed. And so why are they going to be jerks? They, they've they had everything. Right. They, they've reached all their goals, uh, you know. And so they're just, they've got great family lives, you know. They're making great music. And, you know, that's why I'm really not shocked. I'm more relieved when I meet one of these hero type dudes. And he's just like really cool, you know. Is there anyone like, left uh, that you haven't like met? Trower. Yeah. Trower, I met. Robin Trow? Like three or four years ago. And he was kind of a hero of mine when I was 17. I, I was uh, learning. I learned the whole Bridge of Size album in a van, like off this like uh, eight track tape. And it was so funny because you just have to get everything you can and wait for it to come back. It's like you can switch tracks and then get back to it fairly quickly. But we actually learned songs like that. And I told him that and he's like, but there's no rewind, mate. <laughs> I, go, I know. I go, you just have to get it all you can. And the next time it rolls around, uh, you get some more. Um, but he was real sweet to my wife and and super nice and did a great, great show. Um, you know, the guy's 76 and he's touring. You know, He's 76, he's touring. He's got uh, all his uh, 2021 and 22 dates up. So that's pretty sweet. What about I Carlos Santana? Much, did you ever meet him? Because you were in like never, kind of a Santana tribute band as a kid. Uh, yes. Um, I haven't met him, oh. but I got to ask him a question on Rockline one time. Oh. They, used my, they used my question and he answered it. That was kind of sweet. But yeah, he was a hero of mine when I was 14. Um, 
I just, I'm telling you, you know, as far as feel goes and all that, the way he played, um, you could just see it in his face. He'd hit a note and just squeeze it like, and, and like he just like vibrated with the note. It was like completely part of him. Kind of like Stevie last... Ray Vaughan. I feel like he's got that. He's got those like guitar yeah. faces, like the really like intense. Yeah. He's feeling I it. Absolutely felt everything he played. And I met him and got to sit and speak with him. And he actually signed a poster for me. Hmm. Uh, we played uh, this Charlie Daniels, he recently passed away, but uh, he used to have this annual benefit um, and a lot of rock bands would play. And we played on um, one of his annual benefit jams, Charlie Daniels annual benefit jam in Nashville. And I met Mick Ronson that day, you know, that was insane because he's amazing. And, and see Ray Vaughn. Oh. And I got this poster of Steve Ray Vaughn. I go, can you please sign it? And I saw him in the hallway in the hotel. And he's like, I thought it was my singer because he's always walking around with wet hair. And he turned around with Steve Ray Vaughn. Oh, my God. And anyway, so I ended up talking with him backstage. And he kept saying, man, you're tall. You're tall. <laughs> he must have said that like 20 times, how tall I am. You know, and I'm not really that tall. I'm 6'3", but. Uh, he signed the poster and said to Mark, keep standing tall. <laughs> Steve Ray Vaughn. I was like, wow. I still got it. I, I got that, that is po- cool. I got it. I got the poster laminated. And yeah, he was a very sweet man. Um, he was dead sober when he died. And I, I've actually seen his, uh, he was at a, like an AA meeting type thing and told this story. It's about 30 minutes. It's on YouTube. Hmm. Um, it was, just, you know, he, he is the way he plays, you know, he's very, everything's heartfelt with them. And, you know, so very much, uh, 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 a guy who can feel his, his music. Yeah, definitely. Well, so back to great white, is there any, um, I think I saw some tour dates on the website. Are you guys going to be adding more? Yeah. We're okay. Coming in every day. I'm getting calls every day with oh. more shows added, more shows. I th- like in July, we're playing like 13 shows. So that's pretty good because we're not on a bus like the old days and playing five shows a week. You know, that that's a different era. Yeah, but I thought there was talk of maybe doing an eight week tour with another band and like a package deal. And then you is that did that ever come to fruition? Yeah, or? that comes through every once in a while. And if it makes financial sense, we're not opposed to it. But if we're going to come home dead broke, then, you know, it, it, it's kind of hard because, and the reason people are doing it the way we're doing it to keep the cost down. Sure. Back in the day, you know, you got to realize we're selling millions of records and tons mm-hmm. of merchandise every night. So it was okay to break even on the tour. But now if we break even. It's a know, loss. We come home with a dollar 98. And yeah. It's brutal. Yeah. So, but, you know what I mean? Right. And then would you be making new music? Um, Cause I mean, I know that the music doesn't bring in as much money, but it's also, it's also, you can make it a lot cheaper, right? Like you can, you can yeah. make a new we're CD in there. We're, we're doing it now. Um, I've been writing like crazy. We, we wanted to put this out like, you know, you're or get in the studio a year and a half ago, but it, it's like this whole pandemic thing. And it, it just really kept us from doing it. But now we're, we're talking about it seriously. We've got a lot of music. Um, we just need to get in the room and jam and then put it on tape. You know, it's that simple. Great. We're awesome. hoping to get something out this year because that's our whole motivation to keep this going is to keep making new music, even if people don't buy it, yep. you know, just to have it out there available to listen to. Yeah, absolutely. Well, um, I've had a lot of fun. This has a lot, been a blast chatting with you. I like to end each episode uh, with a charity or a nonprofit. Is there one that you'd like to support or you want to sh- throw a shout out to here at the end? Um, yeah, um, music cares. It, the it's only reason one. I mention music cares is because I really believe they've done more for the addicts, um, alcoholics and their families probably done more than just about anyone as far as, uh, nonprofit organizations. So definitely, um, grateful 
to them for letting me be a part of, of, you know, their team and let me go out and speak to people. And, you know, that, that's been a joy. I, I just love what they do. They actually helped a friend of mine, one of the first guys I worked with, get into recovery just because he plays guitar. If you're a musician, even if you're non-pro, like if you just play in a band and only play the party circuit, uh-huh. they'll help you. Oh. It's, it's really for musicians that are in trouble with addiction. So the first guy I worked with was just rolling out of bed, filling up a big gulp cup with whiskey. And that's the way he started his day. And he was really in a bad spot. And I worked with him. Music Care has helped get him into a rehab. And he has like eight years of sobriety now. Wow. You know, he actually was a counselor at this place he was a patient at for about a year. Huh. He, he, he doesn't do that now. Okay. But he, but he went from patient to counselor. Oh, uh, that's and, a cool a five story. five-year period. So, so Music Care has helped that happen because people that don't have money, they help you get into a facility or rehab or... You know they'll they'll help. You know? Yeah, and it's really sweet. It's a great, great, and a lot of big, big names get involved with it, and raise money. So, well, that's it's great. Pretty, it's just a giving thing. There's no hidden agendas. They all they're just there to help people. Perfect. So definitely a shout out to Music Care. Okay, I'll put that in the notes along with your website so people can check and they can follow you on social media, check out for a, a tour dates. I think you're coming to Phoenix, so I'll try to catch that show. I think it's July 30th, I want to say. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks yep. so much, Mark. I appreciate it. Thanks, brother. All right. Yeah, keep, it, keep up the great work, man. Thank you. I'll talk to you later. Okay. Bye-bye. Okay, bye-bye. Well, I really enjoyed that interview, and I think it was a lot of fun for Mark to get at least some questions that he may have never gotten before. And I hope that I did great white fans proud as well. So a little more obscure on some of the music stuff and a lot more focus on Mark and his life. I think he's an interesting guy and I like that he's trying to help people. I think that's amazing to see someone like that. That's so open to helping others. And uh, as I've always, as always, I've got the website links in the show notes with all the social media. So make sure to follow Mark and great white and me too, if you like the show and you want updates on future episodes. So uh, that's how you can support me and also commenting and sharing and all that stuff as well. So Thank you so much for listening. I hope you have a great rest of your day. And remember, shoot for the moon.